Welcome to Intangibles Podcast. I'm Steve Berg, your host. Success is driven by how as much as by what. How we communicate, how we lead, how we relate to our environment are all vitally important. Intangibles is a podcast that explores the underlying traits, qualities, and behaviors that improve the how. This is accomplished by finding the people who have studied and been successful practicing these soft skills and having informed conversations with them to get to what is learnable. Let's begin. Venezuelan military and political leader, Simone Bolivar, said that judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. It's comforting to find out that there's hope for all of us, no matter where we are on the spectrum of good or bad judgment. I made a good judgment recently. Do you wanna know what it was? I picked this podcast as the very first intangibles ever to have on a repeat guest. Back in season two in early 2018, author and behavioral psychologist Maria Konkova talked with me about deduction and the process that the brain uses to reach conclusions. At the time, we were discussing her New York Best Times, uh, her New York Times bestseller, Mastermind, how to think like Sherlock Holmes, which, by the way, is not her only bestseller, um, pick up the confidence game as well. Um, then somehow, I heard that Maria had embarked on a new project. Um, she decided to go from a standing start, meaning no experience at all, to a competitor in the World Series of Poker within a year's time. Now, anybody who has ever played No Limit Texas Hold'em knows what a tall order that is. And while we're ramping up degree of difficulty, why not throw in trying to figure out how the learning from playing poker translates into making better decisions and having better judgment in your everyday life and writing a book about it. Through whispers and rumors, I had heard that she became a damn good poker player. And upon checking in, I learned that the book was Finnish, which of course confirmed those rumors. The new book is called The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Having read the book a couple of times now, I'm happy to tell you that we are in for a great conversation. Maria, welcome back to Intangible's podcast. Thank you so much for having me back, Steve. It's a pleasure. Why don't... You just give a little bit of backstory to set the table for the questions that I have on making good judgments. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as you mentioned in your introduction, um, I am not, I've never been a poker player. Um, I've never been a games player. I was never someone who was interested in that world or who had any background in it or who really knew anything about it. So when I just started this project, um, I didn't even know how many cards were in a deck. That was the extent of my lack of knowledge. And the reason that I was drawn to the game wasn't because I wanted to kind of explore poker. It was because I became fascinated by the role that chance plays in our lives and how we can learn the difference between the things we can control and the things we can't control. And how do we learn to maximize the things that we control and deal with chance that's going to happen because that's what chance does. It just happens whether or not we like it. And as I was thinking about this topic, I found myself reading John von Neumann's Theory of Games, which is the foundational text of game theory, and learned that not only was von Neumann a poker player, but that poker was actually the inspiration for game theory, that this you know, game-changing theory of the 20th century was born out of a desire to solve a game. Von Neumann at the time was kind of advising on the highest strategic decisions um, in the world. I mean, the guy was working on the hydrogen bomb and he saw in poker a model for complex human decision-making because he realized that poker, like life, is a game of incomplete information. It's a game of humans. It's a game of strategy, of bluffing, of as what, what he called little tactics of deception. And so he thought, you know, if I can solve this, I'll have this beautiful model for how to approach decisions on the highest level. And he never solved it. Poker actually is still unsolved. So chess has been solved. Go has been solved. Limit Hold'em has been solved, but no limit remains kind of the golden ticket for AI and no one has been able to solve it. But he did create game theory. 
And when I read this, I thought, this is fascinating. Let me read up on this poker thing because, you know, if one of the greatest minds of the 20th century thinks that it has so much to offer about decision making, maybe there's something there. And when I started reading about the game, just something clicked in my mind. I thought, you know, this can be the book. Why don't I actually immerse myself in this? Why don't I learn to play and see what happens and use that journey as my way of exploring chance and exploring kind of our ability to maximize our control um, and become the best decision makers we possibly can? Yeah, I mean, that's perfect. And what, you know, what you didn't say, uh, but what poker players know is that, you know, Texas Hold'em has that right balance of, uh, you know, intellect, judgment, and luck, right? There's no, you know, it doesn't lean one way or another. Like chess, as you mentioned, like that is a perfectly, uh, you know, intellect-driven game, right? It's just a combination and permutation of different moves that ultimately end up in conclusions. But poker, especially no limit uh, Hold'em, as that balance. And that's, you know, probably why it's so much more difficult to solve. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually von Neumann um, wrote that he, he did not like chess and he, he thought it was very boring and ditto roulette. He placed them on opposite ends of the continuum because chess is solvable. It's a game of complete information. There's always a right move and you can calculate it. And roulette is the opposite. You can't solve it. It's all chance. And poker is this balance between skill and chance. Um, and so that's, if you're looking for an analog to human decision-making, that's the, that's the ticket. So as I am want to do, uh, I broke the book down into subtopics on, dis- dis- on judgment or what you're calling decision-making. And um, those subtopics are approach, perspective, process, behavioral pitfalls, calibration, experience, risk, and luck. And that's a lot. Um, and it now sounds like we're about to play Jeopardy. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I'll take <laughs> luck for 500, please. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Uh, all right. I hope we get to everything. So I just, I think our, my, my best bet is to dive in and uh, you'll actually get all the categories and all the, all the values. So uh, you don't really have to pick, <laughs> pick one. <laughs> Damn. Um, Damn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but I I've play been on, practicing. Uh, I play a, I've been playing on Alexa every morning. Um, okay. The first one is approach. So approach, at least in my estimation, and in any of these, correct me, please. Approach is how one orients oneself as a starting point for learning to make good judgments. It's like a uh, tools in a toolbox. So I wanted to talk about a couple of those skills that you brought up. Was that you, you, you didn't you know you didn't organize the way I organized it. It was all throughout the book, and I kind of scraped them all together. So. Uh, they're from different places and different, but the first one that I, that I wrote down in my notes was to be determinedly attentive. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I think you're, you're voluntarily minimizing the valuable inputs to the judgment process. Do you want to talk about, you know, what you mean by determinedly, or I guess might've been Eric, I'm not sure, uh, whoever said be determinedly attentive. I don't think that specific phrase, um, actually appears, but I think it's, um, what Eric told me, and it was actually his first piece of advice um, when I, and I, I still can't believe I asked him this question. Um, I asked him, you know, what piece of advice he has for me, what the big, most important thing is um, in poker. And the reason I can't believe I ask it is it's obviously, you know, that's the question everyone asks him. And it's just so incredibly obvious. Um, but his answer was incredible. His answer was pay attention. That's it, just those two words. And the more, and it seemed, you know, pretty obvious, okay, pay attention. But the more I learned about the game and the deeper I went and the more I worked with Eric, the more I realized just how much that basically underlies everything. Because so many people at the poker table are just distracted. They only pay attention to the hand they're in and they're not even really paying attention. They already know what they want to do. They already have all these things in their minds and they're not really taking it all in. And especially when they're not in a hand, you know, they're on their phone, they're doing this, they're doing that. They're not following along. And the way that Eric plays is completely different. He is just 
100% present. He is observing everyone. He is taking in all of the information, all of the available inputs. And it's funny, it's actually a theme that was one of the underlying themes of Mastermind, my first book, because it's this idea of mindfulness and of mindful presence. Um, and so it's, it's funny how in a way, um, kind of everything is coming full circle in poker. And I realized that this is something that I'd been thinking about for a very long time, but that really, if you're going to succeed, if you want to succeed at poker, it is so essential and I think not just poker, if you want to succeed in life, it's just so essential to be present and to actually be aware of everything that's happening. Otherwise, how are you going to learn? How are you going to adjust? How are you going to improve? You're not. Yeah. Um, the second part of that is, um, I do believe this is in the book. I hope it, I hope it was. Active open-mindedness. Mm -hmm. And to me, that means uh, there's never actually a default decision, only deliberation. Yes. Um, so how does that, how does that work in terms of yeah. you know, your decision, your judgment? So that actually also comes from Eric. Um, one of the phrases that he told me once that really stayed with me, even though it was very early on in our working together, you know, probably one of the first month, second month, he said something and it just really, once again, stuck with me. And what he said was, less certainty, more inquiry. And yeah. that phrase, it's just so beautiful. It's so pithy. It's so perfect. I mean, basically, there it is. It encapsulates everything. And what he meant by that was, you can never know everything. I mean, life is uncertain. Decisions are uncertain. You will never have all of the information, ever. It's not possible that in any decision, 100% does not exist if you're talking about real life, and especially in poker. I mean, it's a game of incomplete information. And so yeah. when you feel like you're certain, when you feel like you know what to do, and when you're really, really sure about that, you close the door to being creative. You close the door to learning. You close the door to growing and to evolving. And so what he wanted me to focus on was the process of inquiry, the thought process, actually thinking through everything. And so it was very interesting, you know, especially in the beginning, I would always want him to give me very concrete advice. You know, how do I play this hand? What am I supposed to do here? Do I fold? Do I raise? Do I call? You know, what do I do? And he would always say, well, let's think through it. Um, here are all, you know, what are the arguments for this? What are the arguments for that? What are the arguments for the other? And he never gave me an answer. And I'd get so frustrated. I would just basically want to scream at him, just tell me what to do with this hand. And he didn't, it's not that he was being, you know, that he was trying to string me along. It's that he really believes that there's no answer. He can't tell me how to play this hand. How to play this hand is going to change from moment to moment, depending on all of the information. And if I have that inquiring mindset, if I focus on the process and not on this is what to do, um, that's how I'm going to become a great player, a great thinker, a great decision maker. Yeah, that's, you know, I, you know, when I read that um, about the um, inquiry, I immediately was like, oh, that's risk. You know, the greater the risk, the more that you try to understand everything it is about the context of that risk. Um, the, the other thing about approach, uh, which is really important, and everybody thinks they can do it and they can't, is to be non-attached and dispassionate in your uh, judgment. Um, you know, if you are collecting the information you know, being a, a determinedly attentive or paying attention. And if you are uh, actively open-minded, then it leads on that you should be able to make judgments in a non-attached way. Is that right? Um, not necessarily, no. Um, I think that non-attachment has to do with emotion. Um, and it is so easy, even if you're attentive, even if you're thinking, that does not preclude being emotional you can still be incredibly emotional. You can be someone who gets angry while paying attention and thinking through your decision. And if you're not aware of your own emotions, if you don't have that kind of self-awareness, if you don't know how to manage it, if you don't have those tools, then you're going to 
let that seep into your inquiry, let that seep into your decision-making process, and you're not going to realize it. Um, And that happens to everyone. One thing that I've learned is every single person goes on what is called in poker tilt, which means lets emotions seep into their decision-making process. And this is true of Eric. This is true of me. I will, I will defy you if you say there's one person who never tilts. Not true because everyone is human. And even if you're a psychopath, you're going to go on tilt at some point because psycho- psychopaths are very capable of getting angry. And that, that can really hurt you at the poker table. The reason, by, by the way, that I say psychopaths is they don't process emotion in the same way that right. other people right. do, um, non-psychopaths. But even still, they would go on tilt. In any case, so I think that that's actually, that non-attachment is a separate skill that you have to cultivate, that you have to learn. Um, And it starts with actually also paying attention, but in a different way, paying attention to yourself and learning to constantly pay attention to yourself, to what you're thinking, to why you're thinking it, to how you're feeling, to how you respond to certain things, to what your emotional triggers are. and then you are able to say, okay, you know, I'm experiencing all of this because by the way, paying attention to it doesn't mean you're going to stop experiencing it, but at least you'll be able to discount it and remove it from the decision process to the best of your abilities. Yeah. So um, I, in my little subgrouping, in my little brain, uh, I put emotions um, as part of perspective. Mm -hmm. I think emotions are part uh, of everything, honestly. I think that that's something that actually... You can't, a lot of these themes, um, I love your groupings, by the way, I think they're really interesting and and thought provoking, but I do think that a lot of these things like attention, like emotion, really transcend themes and they, parts of them are in all of them, right? Because there's something that's actually so fundamental to being human and to making decisions in a human way. So I'm going to push back on it. Yeah, please do. On that in particular, because... (laughs) Uh, you gave me the ammo to do this. Um, <laughs> and the ammo that you gave me is that in kind of doing the, you know, you know, the self inventory mm-hmm. that when you realize that your emotions are not part of the rational decision process mm-hmm. at that moment, you dismiss them, right? Because then you're no longer playing at, at, at the level of your efficient curve. So, so yes and no. Um, some emotions, yes. But other emotions, they are hot and visceral enough that you're actually incapable of dismissing them. You can realize that someone has really pissed you off. This has happened to me. I've seen it happening, has really gotten under your skin, and you are angry. I mean, I've been called a cunt at the table. I've been propositioned. People have, I mean, I've been called it all. Um, you know, cunt isn't even the worst of it. And I, you know, it gets to me and I can rationally say, okay, you know, I am going to dismiss this, but hell no. I mean, that really just, uh, that it's, it's impossible. Of course, it's going to affect me. I'm human. And I know that. Yeah. And I just, at, at that point, all I can do actually in those types of situations, what I've learned is the best thing to do, even though I'm a tournament player. So I'm actually not allowed to just randomly get up and leave. I get up and leave. And I actually miss hands. I've sometimes missed a lot of hands because I know that I can't think rationally at that moment. That's not me being able to dismiss the emotion. So let me push back to your pushing back. Recognizing the emotion only works with with emotions that have not gotten to that point. But unless you're able to prevent them getting from that point, which you can't always do, you can do your best. This is kind of the element of control what you can and really try to do your best, but also I think one of the most important things of a successful decision maker and a successful poker player is to recognize your limitations, to know when your best just ain't going to cut it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you're, ta- you're talking about limiting the impact to the extent you're capable. And, and you're, what you're saying is nobody is capable of limiting 100% of the impact. Exactly. And sometimes you have to, and you also have to be self-aware enough where you realize when you've crossed the line, where you just can't limit it enough to make a good decision. 
And that's very difficult because if you're someone who's very good at self-control and someone who's become very good at self-regulating and at actually kind of dismissing those emotions, then it's very difficult for you to admit that there are situations where you can't. And that's actually what I studied um, in graduate school overconfidence. I think that a lot of, and self-control, you know, my, my graduate advisor was Walter Michel, who kind of created the whole literature of uh, 20th century self-control or delay of gratification after his marshmallow studies. And um, so it's something I'm very well aware of. And it's something that is so easy to just think, you know, I've got this down and you aren't objective about yourself. I can see when someone else is tilting. And even today, to this day, I will sometimes not realize just how tilted I am in certain situations until after. And then after I make a bad decision, that's when it hits me. And I think, uh oh, I need to, I need to clear my head and take a step back. All right. So or category two or subcategory two, and, and that's perspective. Um, so as I think about it, perspective influences how the information that you've gathered is actually understood, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Uh, how one understands things actually impacts the decision process and the decision process then in, impacts the outcome. So I, it seems that it's important that we should take into consideration perspective. Um, one of the things that I thought was brilliant about the book and immediately started sharing it around after was um, Loden thinks. Um, explain Loden thinks to people and why Loden thinks what, why that game, uh, is, is, is important. Yeah. I, I love Loden. Um, Loden thinks is one of my, uh, is one of the things that I've really taken, uh, from poker that I think should just be common knowledge. Um, and it, the, the name Loden is the last name of, um, of a poker player. Um, and the game basically is all about trying to figure out what your target or Laudan in the game thinks the answer is to a question. So you have people basically, let's say I'm the Laudan. So you will ask me, you know, Maria, how far do you think it is from, you know, from New York City to, I don't know, to Paris? Cedar Rapids. Many, to all Cedar right, Rapids. to Cedar Rapids, to Cedar Rapids. And I will have to think of a number in my head and kind of lock it in, write it down. And then you and somebody else or multiple other people, um, but usually it's two people, will try to guess what my number is. So the key here is that the actual distance doesn't matter. You have to figure out what I think the distance is. And so maybe right. you, th- you know that I don't know where Cedar Rapids is at all that I have, you know, a big failure in geography, you have kind of been in on what I may or may not know. And so you might realize that I think that, you know, it's whatever, 100 miles or whatever, someone else might think that I think Cedar Rapids is in California. So I'm going to guess 3000 miles, or whatever it is. So the person who proposes the game starts with a number. So you'll say, okay, 100. Um, And then the other person will either accept the under. So they think that I think it's less than a hundred or propose a higher number. And you go back and forth until someone accepts kind of the under of the proposition. And then you ask me, what did you think? And the person who wins, wins the money. Um, A lot of money has, uh, has gone to a lot of things. People have bet thousands, tens of thousands of dollars on a question. So, but the significant part, right? The significant part is being able to put yourself mm-hmm. in the perspective of somebody else. Absolutely. And that, is, and that is so key about judgments, <laughs> right? Because that's the imperfection that we've got in the world is because you're just like, everyone's right now uh, in, or in a co- post-COVID environment. Every, why is the stock market going up? Yep. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be going up. That doesn't make any sense. And the, the, what, what people aren't doing is they're not putting themselves in the perspective of, you know, the people that are making the decisions right now in the trading and what they're looking at and what they're thinking of to understand why they might in a rational process be driving the stock market up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I do think that once you kind of, once you master a lot and thinks, or, you know, master the principles behind lot and things, 
it makes you much better at not only playing poker, but at just reading people and making decisions and being empathetic in a way and kind of learning how to think from other people's points of view. Because like I said, actually, sometimes if you know the answer, that can screw you up because that will anchor you to what you think the answer is. Um, so the fact that objective reality really doesn't matter is just a beautiful component of this game because you have to try to dismiss yourself, dismiss your own knowledge and figure out what does this person think. Now, there are so many tools you can use. It's not just your knowledge of the person. It's also paying attention to how they're reacting to your conversation. And so this actually goes back to the first thing we talked about, paying attention. You have yeah. to keep, really pay attention to that person's reaction because if they actually have the wrong, the answer that they wouldn't necessarily give on any other day, you still have to be aware of that and you need to catch that. So your knowledge can actually work against you in multiple ways, not just your knowledge of the objective answer, but your knowledge of the person um, can actually make you overconfident and not pay attention to their reactions, which is crucial. Yeah. Well, look, there's something that I want to, with regard to perspective, there's something mm -hmm. that I like, I, I just want to put on the table. Sure. Um, and, and that is that, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, you, you, you will never have complete information, mm -hmm. right? For, particularly for the most difficult decisions that you ever make or judgments that you ever make, um, that, that information can never possibly be complete. But I think what's really important to understand is that these decisions or judgments despite incomplete information, they can still be very high quality, Absolutely. right? They can still be actionable decisions or judgments. They can still, let's call it win, uh, for lack of a better, for most of the time. Absolutely. Right? And so that, that's why kind of understanding your perspective, understanding other perspectives, um, being comfort with that, comfortable with that a little bit of discomfort, it, it's, totally, it's, it's totally an acceptable state of being. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that um, I think that it's not just an acceptable state of being. I think it's an absolutely necessary state of being that yeah. you need to become comfortable with uncertainty. Otherwise, you're just going to be paralyzed. And you're also going to have a false sense of certainty because you will think that you know more than you do. You'll be overconfident in your decisions. Yeah, there's a quote in the book. Um, I can't remember who you attributed to. No amount of modeling will ever be able to capture the vagaries of human nature. That's just me. No one attribute. Ah. No one to attribute that yeah. to. <laughs> That's a brilliant. That's a brilliant quote. I'm going to read that in a book of quotes someday. Um, so uh, we kind of dashed through perspective. Maybe we'll come back to it. Maybe we won't. But uh, in, in order to get a bunch of things that I really want to get on the table on the table, I'm moving on to our third category, Alex. Uh, and that is perspective, a oh, oh, process. Uh, you, I, good, you caught my Jeopardy. I, I heard you giggle. I, you caught my Jeopardy reference. Um, of course I did. Uh, right. Excellent. Um, so process, I'm looking for, process. I'm waiting for the daily double. <laughs> the daily double doesn't come until we get to luck. Um, so good judgment is thinking correctly about controllable variables, right? We're going to get to the fact that there are some things that they're, they're not controllable. Uh, but, you know, if you're thinking correctly about the things that you can control, mm -hmm. that means that you probably, not probably, must have a predetermined process in which to think about those things, right? So process for good judgment has probably, in my mind, some immutable principles uh, and some variations. So I want to talk about process because I think you sure. learned a ton about process. So, you know, I know, you know, you'll find out the, the people when they read this book, you, you took a ton of notes, you analyzed it, you did a bunch of things around decision making, you memorized probabilities. I'm going to just ask broadly, like wide open question, how did you hone your process from a standing start over time? Is that too hard of a question? No, no. I mean, I think that it's, it's a, it has to be a constantly iterative thing. You can't, I think what you said at the beginning, that there are some immutable principles and then kind of things that change. I think that's absolutely right. And the immutable principles, one of them is that you have to constantly revisit your process, that you can't yeah. think that this is what 
I have to do always because you always have to update it with new information. You have to be willing to change your mind. You have to be willing to change how you go about things, how you how you do things, how you think through things. And so the way that you hone your process over time is by actually looking at the feedback and doing self-evaluation so that you can figure out where you're going wrong. Your process is never going to be perfect and you're going to make mistakes. And poker is very, very good at making sure that you know that you're making mistakes because yeah. you actually will lose money and eventually yeah. mistakes over time will will cost you. And so and so what I always, you know, what I've gotten used to doing is to actually kind of writing my thought process in the moment so that I then have an objective roadmap that I can go back to because it's impossible to recreate it in retrospect because hindsight bias is just way too strong. Once we know the outcome, we kind of color how we were thinking about it and what our process was. That might not have actually been our process. And so I think that it's it's very personal. So my process is not Eric's process when it comes to poker, even though Eric is the one who taught me. Um, and it's something that you have to you have to figure out what works for you. But it is kind of, I think in any decision, one of the most important things that Eric taught me is to think multiple steps ahead, to realize that any decision you're making right now isn't just a decision in a vacuum, that there will be multiple steps to this. So you have to anticipate what all of the possible, basically, game tree branches are stemming from your decision and know in advance how you're going to respond to each and every one. And if you don't know in advance, then probably there's something wrong with this decision. And you have to actually figure that out. Because if you say, well, you know, I want to raise here. Um, okay. Well, you know, what are your reasons for raising? Fine. Okay. So that's kind of the first part. Now, what happens if someone re-raises you? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, you know, yeah. I... I don't know. Well, then do you really want to raise? Or, well, I guess I'm going to have to fold. Do you want to fold this hand? Is this a hand that you're be, you'll be comfortable folding? No. Well, then don't raise because that is actually a, a game. What you're leading to. Exactly. Yeah. And, you can, and you can simulate the probabilities. Okay, I'm going to get raised probably you know, 20% of the time because that's how often this person has been raising. I'm going to get called this percent of the time. I'm going to get this outcome, this percent of the time. And obviously there's a lot of uncertainty in there. You don't know exactly, but you have to actually learn to think through all of those different trees. And this is true, you know, this is something that is true outside of poker and that people tend to forget. They just do things or say things or, you know, or act in a certain way, make certain decisions uh, without thinking through, okay, what are all the possible ways that this can that this can actually go right? What are the ways it can go wrong? And how am I going to react? And so it's a, it's a feedback loop because once you realize that, then you might have to actually tweak your process because if you see that you keep coming to a decision and then the feedback loop tells you, no, it wasn't the right decision, then something something's wrong. So you led perfectly. I'm going to add, by the way, I'm going to uh, ask you about fact patterns. One more question, just a second. But you just led to the perfect segue, so I'm going to take the advantage. Just explain really briefly, observe, orient, decide, act. The OODA loop. Um, so that is from... No, OODA loop. That's from John Boyd, um, who was an Air Force pilot. And he basically, he crafted this term, OODA loop, to talk about how you're supposed to fight how you actually act as a pilot um, when you're when you're in a fighter plane and you need to get the enemy. So the OODA loop is, you know, you have to realize, kind of observe and see what's happening and then orient yourself in that situation, decide what you're going to do, and then act. But the important thing is that you need to try to get inside your enemy's OODA loop so that you can anticipate what they're going to do and respond to that in kind. And that's become kind of this decision thing that's taken on um, a life of its own and gone far outside of 
fighter pilots and all and you know and and, and uh, that entire world because it's just so powerful that key insight get inside your enemy's OODA loop how are what are they observing how are they orienting what does that mean for how what they're likely deciding and what they're likely to do now let me actually respond to that in advance let me anticipate it and let me act in that way. But this is a constantly evolving process right. because if you get in their OODA loop and they realize that and they get into your OODA loop, then the, the loop changes. And now you have to reorient and do it all over again. And so it's this, you know, this constant back and forth, especially if you have two worthy adversaries. This is why I love behavioral psychology. Okay. <laughs> um, now, now the fact pattern question. Um, can you please uh, recount the story, if you will, of Eric Seidel in a high stakes tournament. He's heads up, he's playing against a very hot player and he's calling a very large bet with a Jack high, meaning the best, you know, the, the best thing that he can lay down when they call you know, when he's going to show his cards is a Jack. Yep. And, you know, and, and, and this is for a lot of money and it's just, it, you know, it's either he's going to win or the other guy's going to win. Go ahead. Give it to us. <laughs> um, I won't, because I assume that your audience isn't poker players. I won't take you through the whole hand step by step, but instead I'll, uh, I'll start with just that, that pivotal decision and how in the world do you call with Jack high? So just for people who have no background in poker, calling with Jack high is really, really hard, even in the best case scenario. When you're talking about a difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's really, really hard because just the amounts of cash are mind boggling. So this means that you don't have a made hand at all. You have nothing. You just have a high card. And basically anything beats you. And the, the way that Eric actually came to this determination is by a very slow, careful, deliberative process where he not only rewound the entire hand step by step, but actually their entire heads up match up to that point. Eric is someone who normally acts quite quickly. You know, normally takes him 10, 20, maybe 30 seconds. That's rare. But here he took minutes. I mean, there's this hand is available. You can watch it on YouTube and you just see him just, and you can see his face. You can see him thinking and just taking it all in. And he realized that the way that his opponent would have played the hand if he had Jack High beat was going to be quite different. It was kind of this fact-finding mission where he realized there are gaps in your story. Your story doesn't make sense. If you had another high card hand, if you had you know, an ace or a king, you would have raised beforehand. You wouldn't have actually, you wouldn't have uh, just limped in pre-flop. If you had you know, a pair, if you had this, if you had that. So he goes through every single thing he could have had and realizes this guy is aggressive. This guy is good. This guy would have done something very different had he actually had a strong hand here. And so I am going to call with my Jack High. He does this on television. Everyone is watching. Everyone is seeing this. And he's right. Um, and it's just such a beautiful call down where, you know, talk about getting into your opponent's OODA loop. He, he tried to figure out, you know, how would he have acted in every single different scenario? And he determined that the way he acted right now means he's bluffing. Yeah. So, so anybody from the outside would have looked at this and said, oh my God, that is immensely risky. But he realized that the risk wasn't as high as it appeared on the surface exactly. because the fact, pat, the fact pattern he was observing didn't match what would need to have been the fact pattern if this, the, the player he was playing against really had something. You know, most players wouldn't have even gotten that far. Most players would have yeah. instantly folded their jack high without even without even starting to think it's too risky to call. You know, because it's just an insta fold for for so many people. You've got nothing. You know, ace high, king high. You might you might call jack high. Nope, out of there. Yeah. And the fact yeah. that he even stopped, that he even actually paused to reflect, and didn't fold right away. That just speaks volumes about his experience and how good he is at doing what he does. 
it reverts back to our, there's never a default decision. Exactly, be, right? exactly, exactly. Right. Less certainty, more inquiry. So he was, more inquiry. you know, there is, most people at that point will certainly be folding and they know, oh yeah, I fold here. But he just always, always stops and inquires and asks, is this the right decision here? And that's just, it's such a powerful habit. It's so difficult. He always tells me over and over, you know, stop and think before you act. Even if it's just a few seconds, think through all the alternatives quickly in your mind. And it's so hard. It's so easy to forget to do that. Yeah, it is. Uh, That was just, that that was a beautiful example. And it's so illustrative. So I'm glad we covered it. Um, onward, um, behavioral pitfalls. Uh, so as a behavioral psychologist, you know that there are some default human responses, right? That work to counter, uh, good judgments, right? Uh, you called out a number of them in your book. You didn't, you know, there's an exhaustive list, uh, you know, and thinking fast and slow, or there's a number of other, uh, texts. Sure. Uh, you, you call out a number of them in in your um, your, your, your uh, uh, the book that we last talked about, um, thinking like Sherlock Holmes. Mm-hmm. Um, but so let's talk at least about some of the ones that can get in your way and be counterproductive for you. Um, and yeah, because people can just look these up, we'll, we'll, we'll be quick about it. But uh, you touched on briefly illusion of control, mm-hmm. right? That's a, it's yeah. a big one. Uh, it's, it was a big one in inspiring the book because that was actually what ended up being the heart of my dissertation. I started out studying self-control um, because as I already, as I already told you, you know, I was working with Walter Michelle, self-control is what he does. And we very quickly realized that what we were seeing in the environments we were looking at, which were stochastic environments with a lot of uncertainty where people were making risky decisions was the illusion of control people who are normally very, very high in self-control and very good at controlling outcomes and very good at making correct decisions, when that control was taken away from them, when you placed them in an environment that was much riskier, where there was much higher uncertainty, they still thought they were just as in control as they were because they weren't observing Mm -hmm. and they weren't actually taking the negative feedback from the environment. And so they kind of fell for the illusion of control. And that's something that you see all the time. And it's something that's very difficult to, to fight because we like being in control. And so we'll, we'll grasp for that. We'll grasp for that illusion whenever it's available to us. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll consistently overestimate our ability. Um, description of uh, experience gap. The description. Uh, which is fit. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. The description experience gap. Um, and it's the gap between how we learn from description and how we learn from experience. And that gap is huge. The human mind does not learn well from description. It learns from experience. And unfortunately, the reason this leads to a lot of problems is that we don't experience things, quote unquote, correctly. We don't experience things in the right number in order to actually be representative of how often these things happen. That's why our brains are so bad at probabilities. That's why we're so bad at kind of grasping what's you know, 10% looks like, what 2% looks like, what 20% looks like. If it happened to us, we kind of have this outsized idea of how often something happens. If it doesn't happen to us and we just hear about it, we dismiss it a little bit more. And this is true of just about anything. You know, we just don't learn in a systematic fashion. And one of the things that poker is just a beautiful tool for is bridging that because you are experiencing situations over and over and over and over and over. You're actually sampling correctly. It's one of the only times when that happens. So you learn what 2% feels like. You learn what 8% feels like. You learn that actually 1% is huge, that if I can gain a 1% edge, I am ecstatic. I am over the moon. This is awesome. You know, that that is actually such a big difference between because you know over thousands of times that one percent grows into lots of money and lots of you know lots of added value and it really helps in the real world because all of a sudden we understand just how uncertain things are that not only is nothing 100 percent but 75 percent is not certain 
at all. You know, that means that there's a quarter chance that the, something isn't going to happen. I use the, ex yeah. uh, I use the example of, um, Trump selection when everyone w went crazy and said, no one predicted yeah. this. And everyone yelled at Nate Silver because they said, oh, right. you, you think you're so good and you're so bad. Nate Silver had Trump winning at two thirds probability. I, I mean, Hillary Clinton winning at two thirds probability. And, you know, that's, there's a lot of, there was a big chance. There was, I don't, I don't remember what the percentage was. I think 23% chance that Trump was going to win something like that. And that's huge. Yeah, yeah, I think it was I think it was even closer. I think you had Maybe. I think it was like 70 30. And everybody Maybe, just went, yes. oh, 70%. 70% equals 100% in my mind. He's exactly. winning. Exactly. And that's what we always do. Um poker really cures you of that and I think it's actually um not at all surprising that Nate used to play professionally. Um so you so just a, a perspective thing, right? Um again for anybody that any play, plays poker. Um there's the same odds of flopping a pair in Hold'em, as there was for Trump winning the election. Yep. And if you've ever played, like, you know, like, hey, yeah, I've done that before. Okay, when so I it's have, not 100. percent Yeah. When I found, you know, I was trying to figure out a good comparison to make, and when I realized that, I was so happy because that's such a good example of, yeah. uh, you know, it's yeah. such a visceral kind of illustration of it because anyone who's played poker knows you flopped pairs. It happens. Yeah. 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 I mean, and you're right. The the solution though we, we we somehow want to push it aside, is probabilistic thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we just need to get better at that. We just need to do that. We need to think about odds, and we need to understand what those odds mean when we think about them. Um, all right, I'm going to go for one more uh, under the behavioral pitfalls, and that is thin slice judgments. Sure. Um, thin slice judgments are using a thin slice of someone's appearance, behavior, something about them to make a just blanket judgment about who they are. And we do this yeah. all the time. We do it completely subconsciously. We do it in a matter of milliseconds, not even seconds. You see someone and all of a sudden your brain already has all of these different associations activated and you've probably made a decision as to whether you think they're trustworthy, whether you think they're nice, whether you want to hire them if you're actually in an interview, all sorts of things, whether you want to vote for them if they're a politician. It's crazy the important things that we decide within just fractions of a second. We don't realize it, of course. You know, we would say, oh, no, you know, I looked at this, at that, I deliberated over this. But we hardly ever change our mind after that initial mm. kind of judgment. Yep. And something that I realized when I, when I played poker is just how often you do that. Well, like I said, you do it always, but just how often you fail to correct for it and actually make decisions based on it, even if you know exactly you know, what this process is. I mean, I've studied it. Like you said, I'm a psychologist. I know all of the literature behind this. And yet I was still making decisions based on these thin slice judgments because it's so hard to catch yourself doing it. But poker, I think for me at least, has been very good at teaching me to say, okay, you know, let me just draw a fresh slate and figure out what do I actually know about this person? What data do I have? What can I what are the behaviors? Because the only thing that matters are the behaviors. That's your actual data. Not, oh, you know, he has big biceps and is wearing a tank top and has a tattoo of a dragon and this and that. I'm not actually talking about any specific player. So if you have a dragon tattoo, I'm sorry. Um, but, yes. I, but I'm going to go with little old ladies. You know, the <laughs> all little right, there old you ladies go. that sit there kindly and you think, oh, she would never hurt a fly until all of a sudden she's got all your chips. Exactly. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so fifth is calibration. And I love things like this, these kind of second, second order um, ideas. And essentially what they, what it means to me is like, we can follow a process and think we're making good judgments, but we may not be yep. or yeah. Right. Or we could be doing even better than we are doing. We're like, oh, I'm doing great. But no, you're not calibrated. You, you, you know, you're doing it 85 percent and you could be doing 95 percent. So we need to have, in my mind, and I think in your mind too, uh, calibration on our judgment quality, right? Um, so my first question on that is, so how did you learn or how should we learn to tell kind of faulty intuition from real data, <laughs> kind of signal from noise? So um, 
the way that you know the way that you phrase that faulty intu- intuition from real um that and the specific answer to that is you can't there is no way of doing that and you need to realize that so all of the literature all of the psychology literature on intuition tells us that we have both false and true intuitions and we are about 50 50 at figuring out which is which we don't have a clue and no amount of training will have us you know will will enable us to have a clue so here's what i say um your intuition your intuition normally does not matter unless unless you're actually an expert in this field and you are someone mm. who has expertise and experience because then it's not intuition what it is is knowledge masquerading as intuition because you are at that moment unable to consciously access exactly how you know something. But the way you know it is because you've done this thousands of times. You've seen the situation a million times before. And you know, you've picked up signals. And even though I might not be able to articulate to you what I'm picking up on, and so it feels like my gut, it's not my gut. It's because I'm an expert in this specific thing. And that's the way you distinguish it because unless you have expertise in something, just dismiss that and say, I, okay, I can't use it. So let me rephrase. How can we evaluate if we're thinking uh, as correctly as we can be? Well, like I said, I think, um, I think that's actually a little bit different from intuition um, because intuition, we've already kind of answered how you figure out whether to trust it or not. Don't trust it unless yeah. it's not intuition, right. <laughs> unless you're an right. expert. Um, But then in terms of calibration, you need to look at feedback. You need to constantly look at the feedback you're getting. And the feedback is not just the outcome. It's the process. Was I thinking correctly? So you have to just get into the habit of thinking through your thought process after the fact. And the way that I did this, actually, the way that I became better calibrated is I knew that I would have to describe every single hand to Eric. And so after every decision point, he would ask me why. And so I got into the habit of asking myself why beforehand, because I knew he would ask me, okay, I want to do this. Why? Why am I doing it? What are kind of the reasons? Just always be asking why so that I could go back through the process later on with him. And honestly, he helped me recalibrate because he is someone who's an outside observer who can actually talk through this with me. This is something that I... You know, learned from my first book, Mastermind, Holmes becomes a much better detective and a much better thinker and much better calibrated because he has Watson. He has someone to talk through everything with. He has someone he's explaining it to. So I think that's actually one of the best ways that we can help ourselves is get into the habit of actually talking through things and having someone else weigh in on your process, someone you trust. Because you, like I said before, and I think this is something that's important to stress over and over and over, you can't be objective about yourself. So it's really, really difficult to calibrate yourself. You need something, you know, it's like any instrument needs, how do you calibrate an instrument? Well, you can't, it can't calibrate itself. It needs something else. You need a tuning fork. You need a piano to see what actual middle C looks like. You need to have someone with a better ear than you. You need a piano tuner who has all of these different things, all of these different tools. The piano can't sit there and be like, my C is off, excuse me. And the person playing it who hears it every single day is potentially not even going to notice that the C is kind is a little bit off unless this person is, you know, a brilliant musician. One thing I will point out uh, is that you had uh, the self-awareness, and it's clear when you read the book, to acknowledge that there were shortcomings and that, you know, that is an important step, a crucial step to making better judgments and to calibrating is to go, yep, yeah, you know what? I recognize that that's a shortcoming. I need to work on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that you just, I think that your default mode needs to be, I need help and I need to work on things and I need to improve. <laughs> I mean, because that's always true. It's never not true. When do you not need to improve? Yeah, you're right. It, there, there's no, there, there's no, you're right. You're right. Uh, all right. Scooting along in the interest of time, um, experience. This is number six. You have seven and eight to go. Uh, Mike Tyson says that everyone's got to plan until they get punched in the face. And 
despite our aversion to being punched in the face, it seems that you learned that you cannot skip that on the way to refining your judgment. Um, so there's a, at least one or two questions on that. Um, a point that I want to make before that is you're not saying don't use theoretical knowledge for better decision making. You, got, you do need to know what's knowable. Um, that should be the baseline, but experience has to be a, com a component. I, I believe that's what you're saying. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so the obvious question, which I think the answer is yes, is experience the only way to gain objectivity? No. Okay. <laughs> you can, I mean, I, I actually think that experience, as I've said, can be very skewed. Experience can make you think that you're objective because you've experienced something and actually it makes you much more subjective. So experience does not have a valence. It's not like experience is good or bad. Um, and you need to, the only way that experience will actually be a tool in objectivity is if you have experience that spans, you know, years and numerous situations and you can be sure that you've quote unquote sampled correctly, but then the world might change. And so your experience was gained in a different environment. And so you need to just have the self-awareness and the tools to realize, okay, my experience actually no longer matters. My experience was, is obsolete. I trained, you know, how to, how to do this when computers didn't exist. And all of a sudden we have AIs playing against me and it's a different world and it's a different playing field or whatever, whatever it is. You need to realize that not only there are a few different things that I, that I said here, but I, I want to just kind of summarize them. One, not all experience is created equal. Um, you need to make sure that you are actually experiencing correctly um, because some experiences can skew you. And two, the world changes and your experience is only as good as insofar as it's a match for the environment. So when you all of a sudden are in a very different environment, you need to realize that your experience may or may not apply any longer. Aha, aha, yes. So that you could be making consistent judgments using a consistent process that worked yesterday and they don't work today. Exactly, and then you have to say, okay, need a new process rather than say, right. oh, stupid environment. You need to be able, right. because you can't change the environment. What you can change is yourself. Nice. Okay. This is a topic that I, I, I know I'm just really moving fast now, but I've got to get to this one because it's maybe my all, all, maybe my all time favorite topic of ever. And it's risk. Um, it's, and probably it's because what I do all day is kind of quantify and define <laughs> risk. So everyone um, deals with uh, risk and uncertainty and making judgment but we seemingly do a poor job of quantifying it and understanding it. Um, you learned some things. We already talked about less certainty, more inquiry, right? The more mm -hmm. it seems like there's something, a risk, the deeper you deep in and break it down so that you can understand it. Um, what The question that I have is, so, you know, aggressive decision-making, mm -hmm. which I think is a euphemism for assuming higher risk. It's not in a person's human nature. But it is often required to outperform the status quo. You've got to be able to take on a little bit more risk or you'll get the normal outcomes that everybody else gets. Can you talk a little bit about how you, one, become more comfortable uh, assuming a more aggressive uh, posture in decision making? Uh, and two, when's the, the right time and when's not the right time? <laughs> I mean, this is such know, a complex that was question. Huge, right? Um, yeah. Because they're just, you know, this is this is a dissertation, um, and I, I'm not trying to do that to say that to dismiss the question, but rather yeah, to no, say that there's going to be no adequate answer. But I think there are a few different elements here. One, people have different risk propensities in different environments. So I think step one is analyzing yourself. So I might be actually incredibly risk seeking and very capable of taking a lot of risk in certain situations and incredibly risk averse in others. You need to figure out what your behavioral signature looks like. What is my appetite for risk in different environments and why? You know, what is driving me? Because that's actually going to help you unpack some of your biases, which are either holding you back or keeping you safe. Because there's a really interesting study that shows that actually on some gambling tasks, people who had brain lesions and who had no risk aversion at all um, ended up losing all of their money because they weren't scared at all. They took max risk but they didn't understand that actually there was very important environmental feedback telling them to stop. Um, and so they 
So actually our risk aversion sometimes is very good and it's saving us from ruin. And they just were incapable of doing that analysis. So I think that's kind of step one is understanding what your own risk profile is and why so that you can actually go a little bit deeper and kind of be a self-therapist in a way. And then you need to, I think this is what we've been talking about um, in one form or another throughout this entire conversation, become comfortable with uncertainty. Because a lot of the times people won't take the risks they need to take because they keep wanting more information. They keep thinking, well, I just need to know a little more about this and about that. So if that's one of your problems, then you have to realize, okay, I need to figure out what is enough. And when can I just say, okay, I've done the research now, I have these factors that I can evaluate. And that will actually help you figure out, is this a situation to take risk or not? So some of the some of the elements might be, is this something that I know a lot about? Is this something where I actually can have an edge? One of the things that Eric taught me is, do not gamble without an edge. You know, do not take risks in environments you do not understand. He told me that he would basically disown me if he ever caught me betting on sports, that this was something that I was just not allowed to do. Because 99% of people lose a lot of money on sports betting. Everyone thinks they're great. Nobody is. He personally only knows two successful sports bettors, and he knows almost all of them who've been successful in the long term. And everyone thinks so, they can do this. So that's not an environment where I even want to step in because I don't understand yeah. it at all. Um, and so that's kind of going back to knowing your shortcomings. You wanted to uh, jump in. So I am going to make a choice, and I'm going to give up my discussion of luck for one more question on risk. Okay. Um, in the interest of time. And the 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 uh, essentially the last question I'm going to ask you is um, there's a difference between playing to survive and playing to uh, to win, yep. right? That, that those are strategy differences, and yes. I think when we think about our risk profiles associated with that, that's why that's the question I'm going to end with today. Um, so you just your thoughts on that? That is something that I also learned from Eric, um, where he analyzed my decision process and realized that I had one big shortcoming. I really wanted to make the money, which means cash in a tournament and not have to go home with nothing or actually worse than nothing because you lose the amount that you bought in for. And so I would actually not take risks as we got closer and closer and closer to what's called the money bubble. And so by the time we got to the money, I would have no chips left and I'd have no maneuverability left. And what he told me was, you need to realize that those min caches, that's what it that's what it's called when you just sneak into the money, they don't actually pay for anything. You need to play for the win. You need to play for the big money. And you can't do that by trying to just sneak into the money because you need maneuverability. You need chips. And so you need to up your aggression strategically. And actually the best tournament players will just relentlessly abuse players like me or like I used to be around the bubble because they realize everyone wants the money. So I am just going to up my aggression. I'm adjusting to everyone else's lack of aggression and their desire to just play it safe by just going crazy. And normally it's going to work. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, those are my questions. As I suspected, it was a lot. So in lieu of the <laughs> traditional uh, final three questions, I'm going to say to the people listening now, uh, one, go back and listen to uh, the first conversation that Maria and I had, which is episode 19. Uh, two, buy a copy of The Biggest Bluff, uh, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. And three, I'm giving it to you, Maria, for the last word on whatever you want to say about anything. <laughs> I I will not pitch myself because you've al already done that. But I would say consider learning poker because I think it will actually make you a much better decision maker and you will realize that you can be a much more effective version of you um, if you actually take the time to delve into it and take it seriously. Thank you very much, Maria, for talking with me again <laughs> and, for your, and for your great work. Thank you so much, Steve. It was an absolute pleasure. This has been Intangibles. You can find this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and many other podcast platforms. You can also find it at its home on the web, which is www.intangiblespodcast.com. I'm Steve Berg. Thank you. Keep an eye out for the next episode.